All right. Uh, very good morning to everybody. Uh, welcome to the session, uh, Journeys to the Cloud, Different Experiences in Video, where we'll primarily be covering video processing on AWS. Uh, my name is Vivek Bhatt. I'm the Senior Product Manager on the Amazon Elastic Transcoder Service. And I have with me Theo Kim, who leads DevOps Engineering at GoPro. And I also have uh, Stephen Godwin, uh, who's a Senior Technical Architect with the BBC. So in terms of uh, what to expect from this session, we'll start off by looking at how video viewing habits are changing and what that means in terms of processing and delivering video. Um, we'll look at why the cloud might be a good option uh, to consider for building your video processing workflows. We'll then look at the different services that uh, AWS provides to build these end-to-end -end workflows. Uh, obviously, we'll talk a little bit uh, in detail about the two core transcoding services, Amazon Elastic Transcoder, and we'll also talk uh, about Elemental Cloud. Uh, Elemental Cloud is an offering from Elemental Technologies. Uh, it was a company that AWS acquired in October of last year, uh, so we'll go a little bit into detail about that. Uh, and then we'll, have, we'll hear from uh, Theo about this new service and platform that GoPro just built, uh, and we'll hear about uh, how that came about and uh, um, how it's being used. And then Steven's gonna talk about how the BBC continues to evolve uh, their video workflows in the cloud using Elemental products. So I wanna start off by looking at this chart from uh, Nielsen, which uh, really is talking about how video usage is changing amongst users. And traditionally, you would have expected, I think what's really interesting in this chart is if you look at the first three bars, they're all about uh, video viewing on devices that are not your primary screen. So like smartphones, your PCs, your uh, multimedia devices, connected TVs, um, all of that. And if you look at the last bar, the live TV, that's decreased 2.1% year on year. And this continues to happen. This is not like an anomaly that was just this year. Um, and what this really means is that video is becoming more and more accessible across a variety of different devices. Um, and it's not just video that was produced uh, professionally in a studio with a large budget. There's people viewing more and more videos that you and I capture on our smartphones, on uh, webcams, on all kinds of devices. And what that also means is um, it's made the process of processing and delivering the video uh, significantly more challenging. Uh, because first thing, you, it's not just the TV that you need to think about in, uh, anymore. There's you need to de deliver to tablets, you need to deliver to phones, um, all kinds of devices. And across all of these devices, you need to think about preparing video for different screen resolutions, different codecs, different formats. And then depending on the kind of use case you have, uh, you might leverage various capabilities like uh, you might want to add a watermark to your video or you might need to have multi-channel audio for if you're delivering across the world and you need to support different languages. And all of these devices have various different standards. So it's not that you just prepare one set of videos and you're done. Um, and this has become significantly more challenging. And traditionally, on-prem uh, video processing solutions worked because you had the TV that you needed to deliver on, and that was fine. And it was a very like consistent workload that you need to process. But now, with all of these different devices, all kinds of video, uh, video volumes that sort of spike up and down, uh, you really need to sort of, uh, we've been thinking about how the cloud really helps you uh, pr make that uh, process more uh, simple. So in terms of, if you think about AWS and uh, what that means for video processing, um, it, AWS provides a lot of different services and that are really easy to sort of string together to create an end-to-end -end workflow. And we'll go into what some of the services are in just a little bit. And what that means is it's really easy to like set something up within a couple of hours because you these are all self-service. Um, you can use them using uh, APIs, uh, SDKs, um, and all of these services scale very seamlessly. So you can start really small, build a POC within a couple of hours, uh, and it's pay as you go, which means that it's not very expensive for you to like get started. Uh, but then once you're ready for production, uh, AWS has the scale, uh, and um, both in terms of processing, in terms of storage, uh, for you to really uh, go into production. So this is a slide that uh, um, just walks through all the different components in a typical video workflow on AWS and uh, all the different services uh, that you might want to think about uh, when you're building a video workflow. So the very first component in any video workflow would be to um, uh, ingest the video file into an AWS region. 
Uh, and there are services like Direct Connect, um, Snow, Snowball, uh, Snowmobile, which was recently uh, just announced. Uh, and we also have uh, S3 Transfer Acceleration. Um, services like Direct Connect and Snowball make a lot of sense if you already have a large library of video that is sitting on on-prem storage and you want to get that into the cloud and move your workflow into the cloud. Transfer acceleration makes sense if you have a lot of distributed users who are uploading directly into S3 and you want to reduce the latency and uh, get that upload uh, faster into S3. Obviously, AWS provides a lot of different storage services, uh, and you can choose to use um, S3, Glacier, EFS, EBS, uh, and you can define lifecycle policies as you move content back and forth. Um, and then we move on to the core uh, component in the transcoding workflow, which is the actual processing of the video into a different format. And here we have Amazon Elastic Transcoder, which is a native AWS uh, service. Uh, it's a fully managed transcoding service. And we also have uh, Elemental products. Um, Elemental Server is a file-based transcoding uh, solution. And we have Elemental Live, which is primarily for uh, live streaming and for channel playout as well. Um, you also have the option in the, uh, of rolling out your own solution on EC2 or using Lambda. Uh, and you might build your own transcoder or you might use an open source um, encoding engine like FFmpeg. And then once you have all of your output videos uh, ready in S3 or um, wherever you choose to store them, uh, the, you, you de then need to think about delivering these to your end users across all of these different devices. Now, the simplest way to do that would be store it in S3 and deliver it out of S3. But that means that uh, your viewers don't have the best playback experience. And to improve that or reduce the latency, uh, you might want to think about using uh, a CDN like CloudFront. Now, Delta is another product from Elemental, uh, which provides origination and uh, packaging capabilities. Uh, so in addition to acting as an origin server, uh, it also provides things like just-in-time packaging. Uh, so that allows you to like, reduce the number of different uh, video files that you create across all of the different formats. Just, so you just create a base set of uh, adaptive bitrate files. And then um, Delta will basically uh, package it on the fly depending on what request is coming in. So for example, if there's a request coming in from an, uh, from an iOS device, it'll package it into HLS, whereas if it was an Xbox, it'll package it into Smooth. And then obviously there's a lot of other uh, services that you can leverage for downstream processing and DevOps. Um, so you might want to build uh, a CMS solution alongside your video processing thing. So you'd use RDS and DynamoDB to deal with metadata and store all of that. Uh, you can build downstream workflows uh, using SNS, SWF, and you can do any kind of processing uh, using uh, EC2 or Lambda. And across all of these different components, you also have the option to leverage any of the partner solutions available through the AWS Marketplace. So there really is a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can do to get your video workflow onto AWS. So now I'm going to um, talk specifically about a use case on Elastic Transcoder. This is a use case that uh, is a fairly uh, popular one uh, that uh, customers use Elastic Transcoder for. And this is about um, storage and sharing of personal videos. So you take lots of videos on your phone, on your tablet. You might have videos from decades ago that you took on handy cams, digital S uh, SLRs, whatever it is. And you want to build a service that stores all of, this, all of these videos in the cloud and also enables your user to share it with friends and family. So, those videos are not stuck on some SD card or some external drive that have, that's not been touched for uh, years. Um, so the challenge here is you need to be able to handle a wide variety of videos in all kinds of different formats. You need to be able to ingest them. Uh, they need to be transcoded, and they need to be uh, the, the user should be able to like share them with friends and family really, really quickly. So for example, uh, consider the use case where uh, uh, there's a dad who's at a soccer game with, with his kid playing, and he's taking a video, and he records the video, and he can instantly share that with his wife, with his, his dad, whatever, wherever, and they should be able to like, see it uh, fairly quickly. So the performance and turnaround time is pretty key here. And obviously, there's large, you need to be able to handle large variations in video volume, because depending on the time of day, or the day of the week, or around holidays, um, the amount of video that is generated varies a lot, and you need to be able to have your solution scale up and down seamlessly to handle all of, this, uh, all of these videos. Now, as I said, Elastic Transcoder is a managed uh, service from AWS, and uh, it, ha it supports, it ingests a wide variety of input formats, so you can uh, handle videos from all kinds of devices. Um, in terms of output formats, we support a lot of uh, different 
uh, formats and codecs that are optimized for web delivery. So obviously you have your H.264 MP4s. Uh, you then have, we also support WebM uh, containers with VP8, VP9 encoding. Uh, we do animated GIFs. Uh, we have uh, support for a wide variety of ABR formats like smooth, HLS, Dash. Um, and then one of the key things about uh, Elastic Transcoders is the ability to scale seamlessly. So on Christmas morning, for example, when your customers might open a whole bunch of new devices to taking a lot of videos, and you see your video's incoming rate really spike up, there's nothing you need to do with respect to your transcoding workflow. You continue to submit the jobs at the increased rate. Elastic Transcoder just uh, scales up the number of instances in the fleet to handle this uh, increased load. And if you think about other applications that might have similar challenges, uh, you have social media videos where, again, the key is to provide a really snappy response because you're taking a video and the primary purpose is to share it immediately as soon as it's taken or post it uh, for public consumption. Then you have digital media platforms. Uh, and by this, this is a pretty wide uh, term. Uh, and this might cover anything from uh, simple OTT platforms which are delivering TV shows for, uh, to be consumed on second screen devices, uh, et cetera. Um, Elastic Transcode also supports audio only processing. Uh, so that's a great fit for uh, music distribution, uh, for delivering radio on the web, um, and any other audio processing capabilities. Online learning is another key use case that we see a lot of. Uh, so universities that want to um, get their course catalog online for um, consumption by either the general public or by the, uh, students. Um, so that's, that's another option. Uh, and then finally, we have uh, what I call the video marketing and the product video. So you might have a site where you want to create a video that's a review of a product or that talks in detail about a product, or it could be a marketing video. Uh, and all of these, um, Elastic Transcode is a great solution for processing and delivering these videos. In terms of a high-level workflow, um, you have your videos from your consumers uh, that's getting into S3. Um, and then you probably have an app that's allowing them to upload uh, from either the mobile or you might have a desktop app, uh, et cetera, or a web interface. Um, and then once it hits S3, you might want to think about using a Lambda function that fires off an ETS job um, when a new file uh, lands in the S3 bucket. Now, Elastic Transcoder allows you to process jobs in, in parallel. Um, we have the concept of pipelines. Pipelines are essentially queues, and you can think of uh, um, submitting jobs with different priorities into different pipelines. So you might, so you can sort of, you have a little bit of control over how you want to like uh, manage your incoming videos. Elastic Transcoder also uh, offers what we call system presets, uh, and essentially, a system preset defines is a, is a set of um, recommended settings for delivery to a particular platform or a device. So if you, uh, if you don't really have a lot of background in video, but you want to add a video use case to your application, you don't have to worry about going and figuring out what a gop length is or uh, what the uh, uh, distance between keyframes should be uh, what, and things like that. So we have a set of recommended uh, settings. Uh, and if, you're, if you want to deliver to the iOS, you just pick that and you're good to go. And um, the integration with a bunch of different services that I talked about on my previous slide uh, also helps you get started really quickly. Uh, and it means that you're not spending all your limited resources on building a video workflow which is largely undifferentiated, and you'd rather use those resources on improving the core uh, value proposition in your application. And finally, um, Elastic Transcoder handles all of the scaling and the fault tolerance for you. So again, that's, that's part of that managed aspect that I was talking about. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about a completely different use case here about, and this revolves around premium content. Uh, and this, was, uh, this is related to live streaming the Soccer World Cup in Brazil in 2014. And the challenge here was, um, there was there were all these games happening, these matches happening across a wide variety of locations, multiple games happening at the same location, multiple camera angles for the same game. So a lot of video being uh, generated that needed to be processed and encoded in real time for delivery all across the world for consumption on second screen devices. And um, Elemental Cloud was the perfect solution for this. And so if you think about all of the different games happening, this, the, the, the amount of video that is being generated varies a lot. 
because you might have multiple games happening at a single point, in which case you have a spike, and then you might not have any games happening in the evening or the night, in which case there's nothing that's being generated. So Elemental Cloud, again, allows you to like scale your encoding instances up and down depending on how much video you're transcoding. Um, for this particular use case, uh, there were 10 different bit rates, HLS, that were generated uh, for um, delivery across the world and, and other formats. Um, and other sort of similar applications with similar challenges include uh, if you wanted to deliver primary, uh, like premium screen content, uh, premium content, uh, things like TV shows or um, feature films, um, stuff like that, which require you to uh, handle things like captions, uh, multiple language audio. Um, this Elemental Cloud is a great fit uh, to, to do some of that stuff. Uh, it also allows, Elemental Live also allows you to uh, do cha uh, channel playout or uh, live linear. So in that case, it's basically you're, you have a file and you're just sort of uh, streaming that live uh, to all your audience. Uh, a couple of different uh, use cases are government uh, videos and uh, enterprise videos, primarily where there is a requirement to protect the videos and there's some other interesting requirements there. So uh, on a high level, the, the live streaming workflow here, uh, there's a video feed coming out from the stadium uh, that was being ingested over uh, an accelerated uh, and upload accelerator uh, into S3 in a different region, uh, which is where the workflow was set up. And it was HLS in, and then uh, Elemental Live running in AWS region picked up these HLS, uh, this HLS feed that was coming in, and it transcoded it into 10 different bit rates. And uh, that was delivered to end users uh, using a bunch of different CDNs across the world. Um, Elemental Cloud is a slightly different uh, product compared to Elastic Transcoder. Uh, with Element, the biggest difference being that uh, your deployment is for your use only. So there's no other customer's jobs that run on your on the deployment that you create, which means that you have a lot more flexibility in terms of and control over how you want to manage your SLAs, how you manage how you want to manage uh, your job priorities, the kind of uh, uh, settings that you want to use. Uh, which also means that the pricing model is different. So instead of paying by the content minute, you're paying based on instance usage. Uh, Elemental also integrates with a wide variety of uh, DRM uh, providers, ad insertion providers, CMS solutions. So you can really build that premium uh, content workflow uh, in the cloud, um, completely end to end. Uh, and it also provides uh, capabilities that are required for building these broadcast grade workflows like advanced captions about this. I mean, I, I, I didn't really have a lot of uh, insight into all the different uh, caption uh, supports that exist. And when I looked at what Elemental supports, I was just blown away. So that's, that's uh, pretty amazing. So hopefully this has given you a pretty good sense of uh, what AWS provides in terms of core transcoding solutions. Uh, now I, I'll have uh, Theo Kim talk about uh, the application that they recently built, GoPro Plus, and he'll walk us through uh, uh, how they built that and learn more about it. Great. Thank you, Vivek. Can you hear me? Is the microphone on? Oh, there we go. All right. So um, my name is Theodore Kim. I'm the head of DevOps engineering at GoPro. Um, I'm responsible for the operational support of all our online applications, as well as the build and release system and security. For those of you who don't aren't familiar with uh, GoPro, I'd like to just show a, a short one minute video of who we are as a company and what we're trying to accomplish with our latest Hero 5 line of, uh, of cameras. <clears throat> Is this, Is this being, being in the moment? moment? Is, this Is this hanging out? out? And is, and is this, this really, really playing with your kid? kid? Don't, Don't stop, stop what, what you're doing, doing to capture what you're doing. doing. Keep, keep running. running. Keep, keep playing. playing. Keep, keep dancing. 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 Just, Just keep, keep doing. doing. Go, bro, bro. Start recording. Start recording. Introducing GoPro Pro Plus, the easiest way to access, edit, and share your GoPro content anytime, anywhere, plus so much more. Have a Hero 5? With GoPro Plus, you can automatically upload your photos and videos to the cloud directly from your camera. 
Just, just plug, plug your GoPro into a power source and kick back as the, the camera uploads your footage to the cloud, cloud, cloud so you so can, you can easily, easily view, view, edit, and, and share it on all your all devices. devices. GoPro, start recording. This is our new Hero 5 Black. Uh, it is the best camera that we've produced. Uh, out of the box, it is waterproof. It has voice uh, recognition. It also has three microphones, so that if you're in a blustery area, it will only activate the microphone uh, that will create the best audio quality. Uh, and in addition, uh, it is now a camera's a hub. One of the biggest challenges with uh, an action camera or any type of camera is getting the content from the SD card to the cloud or to a usable format so that you can share it. Now with the Hero 5, um, it's a camera's a hub. You take videos, you take photos, you bring it home. It will automatically connect to your Wi-Fi and upload to our new GoPro Plus uh, service. Let me put this down here. Switch back. So at GoPro, uh, Nick started the company back in about 2001. And what he noticed was that um, if you wanted to, to create or take video of yourself doing something, you really needed someone else to take the video for you, uh, and as well as have a, an expensive rig, a camera, to do so. And the idea was to create something that was small, rugged, uh, and something that you could basically attach to your wrist or to your surfboard and, and be able to capture high quality video of you in the video. And that's been our model ever since. You know, our mission is to make it easy for people to capture and share. Um, and our history is really built on passion. Uh, Nick didn't start GoPro uh, as a camera company, he created the company as a storytelling, to be able to share videos of him surfing the, all the great spots in the world uh, with the friends that he met along the way. And so, you know, GoPro has been around since 2001, and the journey has been from him creating a uh, camera strap that he could wear while he was surfing, selling these straps. Uh, through um, in the back of his Volkswagen bus. Uh, and it's been a very, very long journey. Uh, you know, we introduced the first camera uh, in, uh, in 2004. Um, you know, even back then, we only had two employees. And as we've progressed with the Hero 3 and the Hero 4, and finally the evolution of all that, is the Hero 5, uh, both the black and the session. Uh, again, the best camera that we've ever introduced and definitely worthy uh, of an upgrade if you have uh, one of the older cameras. These numbers are a bit old, they're from 2014, uh, but we have now over two billion minutes uh, of YouTube uh, video that has been viewed. We have over 10 million fans on Facebook uh, we have over 8 million Instagram followers, uh, Twitter followers, et cetera. Um, it's been kind of an honor to uh, be associated with such a great and beloved brand uh, as GoPro. And one of the biggest challenges, as I mentioned earlier, was that you, know, you take all this video, you take all these photos, but how do you get it from the SD card to a usable format that you want to share. Uh, it, there's some statistic in which um, if you don't post and share your videos or uh, your photos within the first 30 minutes of taking them, the chances are you're not at all. So we tackled this problem by um, introducing GoPro Plus. And with GoPro Plus, 
you can take uh, your Hero 5 camera or from the Quick Desktop and seamlessly and automatically upload it into the cloud and then share, edit with our Capture and Quick applications. But there were some challenges in doing that. Uh, for example, we needed the ability to simultaneously encode into five different video formats, two HLS, three MP4s, so that we could play back in a variety of devices, whether they're an iOS device or a tablet, et cetera. Uh, we also needed to be able to do this in real time. Uh, we wanted people, once they uploaded, they, we wanted them to have access to uh, their video immediately. Uh, and we also needed the ability to handle massive uh, transcoding spikes. Uh, Christmas 2016, what's going to happen is everybody's going to open up their new GoPro uh, Hero 5. They're going to connect it to Plus, and you will most, will most likely see uh, north of 10 million uh, transcode minutes within the first you know, three days after Christmas. So we needed a service that was able to, to cope with that type of trans, uh, with that type of spike in, in transcoding. Then also, we needed to be able to support multiple codecs and uh, streaming formats, right? Because people are so used to being able to access their content in a variety of different locations, you know, whether it's your Fire TV, or if it's your tablet, or your iPhone, or on the web, and we need to be able to support all those different formats. And more importantly, and also, we need the ability to keep the price performance ratio so that it will fit in the consumer model. This is, you know, GoPro is a consumer uh, company, uh, consumer storytelling company, so whatever solution that we needed to select had to fit into our pricing model. Uh, and one of the great things, uh, since we are 100% hosted in AWS for GoPro Plus, was that we needed some, a solution, a transcoding solution, that was tightly integrated with other AWS services, such as S3 Storage, um, such as um, uh, SNS, and also uh, with uh, a back-end RDS system that we use. So why did we end up choosing AWS? Uh, a variety of reasons. Uh, this wasn't the, 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 the paramount reason, but cost effectiveness. Uh, AWS, ETS, you use only what you use. You don't have to pay for servers or services when you're not actually transcoding. Right? And that's a big plus for us. And also, it's within the AWS um, environment. So if we decided to pick another trans, uh, cloud transcoding service, we would have had to pay data transfer fees out of AWS. Uh, within, with ETS, everything's internal to, to, to Amazon. Also, as I touched on earlier, it's massively scalable. I mean, the ability to one day transcode maybe a thousand minutes using in, for internal load testing or uh, validation testing, the next day to be able to do 10 million minutes within a span of four hours uh, was something very, very compelling for us. Real-time transcoding. Um, as I said earlier, we transcode into five formats, and we want to make sure that that process is parallelized. In other words, they all start at the same time, they all end at the same time, at the same time so that uh, the video formats are available immediately uh, at the same time uh, after the transcode. And tight integration with AWS services, right? I mean, um, we have the, the biggest value proposition to me for uh, AWS isn't necessarily the cloud, it's not even um, the elasticity, but it's also the depth and breadth of services uh, that AWS offers that other cloud competitors simply don't at this point. Um, you know, I, I, I see a time where, you know, EC2 
itself is, is, is going to be downplayed and we're going to leverage all these services that AWS offers in kind of a, a serverless kind of new paradigm. And also a close partnership with the AWS and ETS team. You know, I work with a lot of vendors and they always pay lip service about how important the customer is and how uh, they want to be a true partner with us. But AWS does it better than any other company that I've ever worked with. You know, to, you know, when having a conversation with somebody in the product team, amazingly, three to four weeks later, it becomes a service. I don't know how they do it so quickly, um, but they are extremely receptive. When we were first evaluating ETS, we had some very specific uh, transcoding requirements that, um, that they, they quickly helped us to get. And in addition, um, the Hero 5 also captures quite a bit of telemetry in terms of GPS and acceleration uh, and also elevation so that, you know, when you're mountain biking or when you're uh, skydiving, all that information is captured. And one of the things that we want to do is when the video transcoding occurs, we want to preserve that metadata. Um, and AWS is partnering with us to ensuring that that happens. So this is a, a workflow of uh, our plus um, environment. We have the camera as a hub, which is Hero 5 and the session. Uh, in addition, uh, the second step is uh, uploading to the cloud. And then we create the, the media, which is the derivative. Uh, then we create uh, the upload URL. It goes up into S3, which is one of the other uh, basic uh, S3 uh, AWS services. And then uh, we use Sidekick to, uh, to, to, to put it into a queue. Uh, and that, in turn, goes into ETS. It um, transcodes into five separate formats. Again, two HLS, three MP4 uh, formats. Uh, and then we kick off, once that's complete, we kick off an SNS notification uh, that uh, tells that uh, the entire system and the camera that the process has been completed. And this is a, uh, another diagram. So upload via the quick desktop or the uh, camera uh, as a hub goes through uh, a series of ELBs to our auto-scaled uh, group of media servers. Uh, Sidekick uh, puts it in a queue. Uh, then the media workers uh, go. We do the transcode. We store the information in RDS Postgres uh, SQL bucket uh, our, our, uh, database. Uh, and then uh, we, we fire off SNS uh, notifications to the camera and the rest of the system. Uh, so, so that the uh, so we know that the entire process has been complete, and you know the the idea of you know being able to take video uh, and then have it automatically upload within minutes and be able to trim and share is really huge because um, you know there's a lot of action cameras out there today, but none of them do this. While they're trying to catch up with what GoPro is doing, we're already going to the next level. And we're already um, putting our media in the cloud. We are giving you the ability to trim and share that media and to post it directly um, to Facebook or to other uh, social sites. So, you know, you go skiing, you go back into the lodge, you upload. Um, and that's, that's something, that's an immediacy that we haven't seen in the action camera uh, space. And, uh, you know, people love it. Uh, we've gotten rave reviews from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Time Magazine has voted it one of the top 50 apps of 2016. And we're very, very excited. Um, not only is this the best camera we produce, but this is a quantum leap uh, from our previous cameras. 
So, you know, we are we are excited as a company. Uh, I'm excited with uh, being able to to support GoPro Plus, um, and for you know, for all of you, you know, there's a free 30-day trial on iOS and a 60-day uh, trial on Android. I highly recommend that you go and and sign up. Uh, and, and see for yourself uh, what we've been doing for the, for the past year. And, and I'd also like to state that I don't think we could have done this in the time frame uh, that, that uh, we were set in without partnering with somebody like AWS, right? To be, if, if we were to build all these other components ourselves, it would have taken at least twice as long. But by leveraging AWS services that are already there, ETS, RDS, SNS, um, it just made the entire development process that much faster. So, and with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Vivek. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Just an incredible story, just uh, hearing about how you guys have transformed from being a hardware manufacturer to coming into like software and giving us software services. And I, I did try out the, uh, the app, I downloaded the app, uh, played around with it, and I have to say it was a pretty Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, it was a super seamless experience from capture all the way to consumption. So um, definitely something that I highly recommend uh, checking out. Um, so now we'll, um, we'll be looking at uh, a BBC use case. Now BBC has been uh, one of the pioneers of moving video workflows to the cloud. Uh, they've been doing this for a number of years now. And uh, we have Stephen Godwin here uh, who will be talking about how they continue to evolve these video workflows in the cloud. So over to you, Stephen. Good afternoon. Last week, the BBC published over 10,000 hours of media online. And that's not an unusual or exceptional week. We do that every week. I'm Stephen Godwin. I'm a senior technical architect at the BBC. And over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about how the BBC moves the systems that power iPlayer into the cloud and how that's allowed us to deliver much more content much faster to our audience. So the BBC iPlayer is the largest video on demand service in the UK. It makes content from the BBC's TV and radio stations available online. Both live content, what's being broadcast now, and catch up content from the past 30 days. Increasingly, we're also making available exclusive content online. So one of our TV channels, BBC Three, is only available online. The BBC iPlayer is regularly used by more than 30% of adults in the UK. We support over 1,000 different devices, and just for video, we'd expect about 10 million play requests every day. If you go back a couple of years, iPlayer couldn't have done all those things, and we're actually having some trouble. So it's 2012, and it's, we've just finished um, broadcasting Olympics. It's September 2012. And we're actually quite happy with how the Olympics had gone. We added 24 extra live streams online and had those in addition to our normal broadcast coverage. But the core systems that power iPlayer were having problems. They'd been designed about five years earlier in around 2007, and the capacity was fixed at that time. We were having to employ people to go through the schedules and work out which TV programs we were going to put up online. We were so limited by transcode capacity. We had the rights to make programs available online, but we couldn't put them up online because we were that limited on our transcode capacity. That's because over those five years, we'd added devices like mobile phones, tablets, we'd added HD video, and so it became a challenge of which video we wanted to put up and which video we didn't, having to make that choice. Even worse, the system was actually only reliable in a steady state. And if there, a backlog built up or there was some sort of problem, 
in one of the other systems inside the BBC, it would actually take quite a lot of nursing to get the system working properly again. So we decided to rewrite the system, and because all we'd seen in the video space was growth, and we were pretty confident we were going to need to support more devices and higher res video formats, we decided that the cloud would be the ideal place to build the new system because that elastic scaling model would suit us ideally for that sort of problem. We wanted to be able to give our management a rate card and say, if you double the amount of video in iPlayer, then this is what it'll cost you. If you add 50%, this is what it'll cost you. And that that cost would be at worst linear and hopefully quite a lot better than that as you add more and more content. So it's 2013 and we start building this system. And the first thing we do is integrate with the broadcast chain. So we get um, SDI feeds in from the broadcast chains. These are effectively waves in fiber optic cables and we convert them into something that's a little bit more manageable. Um, so for HD, it's a 30 megabit a second um, feed and for SD, it's 10, uh, it's 10 megabits a second. And what we do is we capture those video uh, streams and we actually write them out to disk in 80 megabyte chunks. So those 80 megabyte chunks, that's about 20 seconds of content for HD, about um, a minute's worth of content for SD. And then we forward them on and write them into S3. And having got these 80 megabytes of chunks, oh, I should talk about the volumes of data as well. Um, so we've got 24 video feeds there. It actually ends up being quite a lot of data every day. We're writing 21 terabytes every day up into S3. And we're using Direct Connect and other forms of peering to make sure that we've got the resiliency there in our connection. But if there is an interruption, it's stored on the local disk and it will eventually be forwarded. So we've got all these 80 megabyte chunks up in S3. And one of the nice things about the video format we're using, it's an MPEG-2 uh, TS stream. And this means that I can take these chunks of video, 20 seconds of video and another 20 seconds of video, concatenate them together, glue them together, end up with 40 seconds of video, and there's no join between them because of the format we're storing the video in. That means I can actually take many of these chunks and glue them together and get an hour's worth of content. And we have an interface to the system that allows us to do exactly that. We can ask it, I want what was on BBC One between 9 and 10 p.m. yesterday evening, and it will go away, glue all these chunks together, give me one big source file that I can then use as the input to my transcoding system. One of the really nice things about S3 is I can actually tell it, I want to create a new file, and then, by the way, it's going to be made up of lots of little pieces, and you already have them all. And it'll assemble them all on its side. And that means I can do something like create the source file for something like a tennis match, which might be three hours long, and use this technique, and it'll take about a minute to assemble that source file. So we call that system our time addressable media store, and we plug that into the rest of our architecture here to actually make video available in iPlayer. So we take those original um, broadcast feeds, which you can see on the left-hand side, and we, chunk, we create the chunks, upload those to S3, and put them in this time addressable media store service. Then you can, the box at the, left, uh, the bottom on the left-hand side, you can see we take data from our playout systems, and we can actually get frame-accurate data on when programs start and stop, and we feed that into this system. And that enables us to then transcode and make the programs available online. We wrote a generic transcode service which actually isolates us from the different properties of different um, transcoding systems. And originally, we actually used FFmpeg for our proof of concept. But that wasn't good enough for us to go into production because we support that, those thousand different devices. So things like set-top boxes, games consoles, I've already mentioned mobiles and tablets, just a huge variety of different formats that we have to support. And that's where we used Elemental's platform as a service offering because it has the, the ability to support all those varied profiles that we needed to generate. So we get the transcoded version out of Elemental, and we place it in S3, and then we distribute it from there to our audience. We finished this work in around September of 2013, so, 20, 2013, so about a year 
after we originally started looking at the problem. And the impact for the audience was huge. We were no longer having to employ people to go through the schedule and decide what we were going to make available online. We could put everything online. That doubled the amount of content in iPlayer. For HD, we got a 700% in the amount of content we were able to make available. And shortly after the system went live, we were able to increase the, the catch-up period, the period we made a ava video available for, from seven days to 30 days. One of our worst cases was around regional news. So at 6.30 p.m. in the evening, um, the BBC's main channel, BBC One, splits into 19 separate channels and we have a regional news program. So at 7, 7 p.m., I get 19 half-hour-long news programs all arriving at once. They're all live programs, and I have to transcode them. The old system coped really badly with this. Whichever program was the last one to come in could take easily 10 hours before it was available online because of the queue of content in front of it. Being in the cloud, we can elastically grow the transcode capacity at that point. It's a very predictable point. We know that the news is coming. You know, um, it's, it's in all the TV schedules. Um, and so we can grow at that point. And now we make all the news available within half an hour of it finishing. So it's 2014, and we move on to the next stage of what we're doing in the cloud. What we want to do is move the live, what we call simulcast systems, into this architecture. So simulcast is our name for um, taking something like BBC One and broadcasting it online as well as broadcasting it conventionally. And so we took those same broadcast feeds I was talking about earlier and actually that same video chunker, but now as well as feeding the video to S3, we're also feeding it to Elemental Live. And that's producing our streams, our online streams of our uh, TV stations. And then we're packaging and distributing it up in the cloud. The advantage of building this simulcast system into our existing cloud-based architecture is we can then perform a clever trick by merging the two systems. So I can take those same Time, uh, that same time data I'm getting from the playout system, the frame accurate start and end time of programs, feed that through logic, and we then use something we call live to VOD, so we can capture the simulcast stream as it's going past and start building up the VOD dynamically um, before the program's ended and very, very quickly. That enables us for, again, I'll use the example of something like a tennis match, which might be three hours long. We can make that available within 10 minutes where previously it would have taken three hours. It would typically have taken duration for us to transcode that program. That's great for our audience, because if they miss the tennis match and they come in and they want to watch it, they're no longer having to wait three, wait three hours before they can catch it online. In 2015, we started expanding the service and integrating with other systems inside the BBC. So, we took our radio system, which was previously a monolith and on-site, and actually merged it into this. And we very intentionally had designed the system from the start to be able to do this, to make this easy. And we're actually able to share a lot of the business logic, a lot of the distribution logic uh, is common between the video and the audio systems. We have over 60 radio stations uh, broadcast by the BBC. So this is actually quite a lot of content um, that we, we moved into the system. We also worked with S4C, who's another public service broadcaster in the UK, and we actually integrated their system, or their video, their content, into iPlayer. So you can imagine the complexities of that, actually integrating with another broadcaster and so on. And just the, uh, so the cloud was very useful for that, just as a, a central point to hook into. But also we could then grow our systems to cope with the extra content we were getting. I work for the, the public service part of the BBC, but there is a commercial arm of the BBC as well. And actually, traditionally, there's a, a very strong firewall between us. Um, and so we have to treat them like a, another third party. And they've built a system called BBC Store, which enables you to buy 
uh, purchase and keep content online. And we actually provide the back-end transcode services to them as well. So again, that was another integration with this system, like a, very much like integrating with a third party. This year, what have we done? Well, we've put quite a lot of effort into moving away from Flash and onto MPEG Dash. And um, that's, um, we have a beta for uh, BBC iPlayer, which enables that and has been running for about three or four months now. And it's probably about to come out of beta and just be the, the default way of us providing, um, providing video. And we've also had a couple of fairly big events so we've had the Euro 2016 Soccer Championship, um, which gave us our largest ever um, concurrent viewership for a, an online event. We had over two million concurrent viewers of that event. And we've had the Rio 2016 Olympics. Um, Olympics are almost, online Olympics are almost becoming business as usual for us now. Um, so we have, obviously, a lot of the BBC's broadcast content is dedicated to the Olympics while this is happening. But we also made over, well, many hundreds of hours of content available exclusively online. You know, if we had a camera, we were recording it, we were making it available for catch-up. So this is a quick overview of our journey in the cloud. This is, shows you the, we gained some really huge benefits to begin with, but then we've grown the system, we've been able to add to it, and we've been able to expand, partner with third parties very easily, and just add extra features um, for our audience. It's massively increased the amount of content you can see we've made available online, and it's just made it so much easier for us to add features. We've moved to a continuous delivery method at the same time as doing this, and it's, it's been a huge improvement for us. So, thank you very much for your time. Right. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Stephen, for that. Uh, always exciting to hear what you guys are doing to make more content available and make it more easy and more convenient to access as well. So thank you. Uh, hopefully, you guys have gotten a pretty good sense of the two different services that we have on uh, AWS for transcoding video, uh, Elemental Cloud and Elastic Transcoder. But before we uh, close the session, I just want to give you a quick summary uh, of how they differ and uh, how you might think of the two solutions depending on the kind of use case you have. So with Elastic Transcoder, uh, you might think about it as uh, a solution that you want to use if you have uh, a use case that involves short form video, video that you primarily want to deliver on the web, uh, user generated content, uh, et cetera. And it's most cost effective for workloads that vary significantly over time uh, because it's a fully managed service. You don't need to worry about how you scale up and down. Um, it provides, like I said, a lot of system presets, the concept of pipelines, jobs. You're not dealing with any of the underlying infrastructure. Um, what that means, so that allows you to shorten your time to market uh, for video applications, especially critical if video is not your core competency, but you want to add a video use case. Allows you to free all of your resources from having to build all these video workflows and focus on your core uh, value proposition. Um, it's a pay-as-you-go, so which means that you can experiment more, uh, get something out, test with it, iterate faster, fail fast, and build the right thing for your customers. Elemental Cloud, on the other hand, you might think as something that you want to use if you want to deliver process and deliver premium content. Um, and uh, given the, the operating model for Elemental Cloud, which is you're running a bunch of servers that only you're using, uh, it makes the most sense if you have consistent workloads where you can spin up a bunch of servers, process it really efficiently, and then shut them down. Um, Given that you're owning your deployment and nobody else is using uh, the instances that you're processing all your video on, uh, means that you have much more control. Uh, now, obviously, you're trading off a little bit of the ease of use uh, that ETS offers, but you're getting, in return, you're getting a lot more control, a lot more flexibility, so you can manage your own SLAs, uh, um, and you, you, you own that trade-off of like performance versus cost. Uh, also offers a lot of uh, um, advanced features, a lot of good integrations with a variety of different uh, solution providers. Um, and uh, in addition to just file-based transcoding, uh, Elemental offers Elemental Live, which is a live streaming service and channel playout, uh, and Delta, which is, I discussed was the origination and packaging service, and a couple of other products. And if you guys want to learn uh, more about any of these, uh, 
please come visit us in the booth. Uh, we are at uh, booth 20, 2635 uh, on the expo floor. And with that, uh, thank you so much for coming. Um, and hopefully, if you guys have any questions, we'll be around uh, for the next five minutes or so. Uh, or you can come visit us on the expo floor as well. So thank you.